The projector starts, and so begins this episode of Movie Nights and Matinees. The podcast for people who enjoy movies from when we actually had to go to the movies. I'm your host, Bill Groves, and this is episode 19, Silent Shivers, in which my guest and I will explore another Halloween-appropriate topic. So once again, dim the lights, find a comfortable seat, and... Oh yeah, don't trip over that extension cord in the dark. Hey everybody, thanks for listening. As Halloween creeps ever closer, we return to once again explore a suitable set of appropriately themed movies. Whereas last episode, we looked at the hybrid genre of horror comedies, which had plenty of representation in the silent era. This time we're going to settle ourselves into that era and look at films that induced shutters in audiences before motion pictures found their collective voice. Joining me here today to talk about silent movies that gave audiences the willies, is Brian Shell, author of the book The Horror Guy's Guide to the Silent Age of Horror Films. Brian, ignore any noise you may hear from the neighbors' children of the night, and welcome to Movie Nights and Matinees. Well, hey, it's gl- glad to be here. Now, to begin with, as I mentioned, your book is titled The Horror Guy's Guide to the silent age of horror films. Maybe we should begin by having you tell us just who are the aforementioned horror guys. Well, I am one of them, Brian Schell. The other is Kevin L. Knights. And for the past almost exactly five years, we've done a weekly podcast where we review four full-length movies and a short. So at this point, we've done roughly 1,600 movies over the past five years. All of them wind up on horrorguys.com, our website, which is a daily film review blog. Each weekday, something new goes on there, one of the four movies or a short. And each weekend, we put out a newsletter, which is from horrorbulletin.com. And all those reviews, plus two additional ones are in there. So someone on the newsletter gets all the reviews, seven a week. Every so often, We put out a book, like The Horror Guy's Guide to the Age of Silent Films, or we do other ones. We've got The Horror Guy's Guide to Shock Theater, the later Universal Films, The Horror Guy's Guide to Universal Studios' Son of Shock, which had the rest of the Universal features. Then we've got books on Hammer Horror, the films of Vincent Price, the films of Peter Cushing, the films of Roger Corman. And just this past week, we've had The Horror Guy's Guide to the films of Amicus Productions. It's been out for about four days now. Amicus made a bunch of anthology films in the 70s. But what we're talking about today is silent films. And as I said, we watch a lot of films. Their first two books were on Universal Studios and Universal Studios' Son of Shock. And some of those in that package were silent. The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Phantom of the Opera, and a few others. So we kind of got hooked on these silent films where we were watching them. And the third book, hey, why not do one on the silent films, all the silent films? So we did a little bit more research and found out there were thousands of silent films that were technically horror films. So we just had to narrow it down to maybe just the best or the most influential of the silent films. And one little bit of research led to another, and we narrowed it down to 34 majorly influential, good silent films that sort of kind of mostly hold up today. And that's where we're at now. All right. Well, yeah, I ran across the listing for this book on Amazon and it intrigued me. And so I got it. And it's it's cool because it's not you don't do a deep dive into the genre or the productions or anything like that. This is really what you might call a kind of a, a pocket guide to these films and it works really nicely on that level you give a a detailed plot synopsis about the film including some that are lost 
And then you simply, you offer your, your comments on it, whether it's an interesting bit of trivia or just your personal reaction. And so, you know, it's inexpensive, but it's like I say, it's, it's a nice pocket guide to this group of films. They're not deeply researched. Let's put it that way. We watch the films. We do the synopsis. We give an opinion. Does it hold up today? Yes or no. What did we like about it? This, that, or the other. And then we move on to the others. With the books, we do do a little additional trivia. But for the most part, we're, we're viewers. We like to watch the films. We're not deep historians or literary critics. We watch the movies. We yeah. like the movies. <laughs> or we don't. Sometimes we just watch them so you don't have to. Uh, well, that can, be, <laughs> that can be helpful, too. So how did you yourself come to be a fan of horror movies? I remember when I was six or seven in Dayton, Ohio, watching TV. Back in the days when their old TVs were still black and white, we had this guy on came on Saturday mornings, Dr. Creep. And he was one of those horror hosts that always showed the old horror movies. And I always remember watching the Universal films. I think the first one that ever actually scared me was The Wolfman. And of course, he had Dracula and Frankenstein, Creature from the Black Lagoon, and all those bad sci-fi movies from the 50s. You know, that kind of thing. The horror host came on and he, he would introduce the shows. Absolutely fell in love with those. Channel 19 from Cincinnati, we could pick up just once in a while when the weather was just right. And they had the cool ghoul and these creature features. And I'd tune into those whenever I could. Back in those days, there wasn't any cable yet. There was no VCR rentals or any of that stuff. So we had to take what we could watch on TV. My parents were not big theater goers. So the Saturday and Friday night, Saturday night movies was all we could watch. And yeah, I just got hooked on those. Well, that's what I was wondering, because you said it, this was a Saturday morning show. I, do you mean Saturday as in, you know, like 12 no. a.m. or something? Because it's a, it just seems a little odd there'd be a... Well, no, actually it was more Saturday afternoon in Dayton, I believe. It came on around noon or thereabouts. Oh, okay. Not with the cartoons, no. <laughs> okay, I thought that's going to be a little weird. Let's see, what did we watch this morning? Did we watch Scooby-Doo or It Came From Outer Space? I mean... <laughs> Well, I would never miss a Scooby-Doo if it was on. Let's put it that way. Well, that's true. And they there had that horror element in there, of they course. definitely did. Yeah. So how did you discover the silent era films? Because I just, I asked that question, but I, I'm thinking to insert my own thought here. And that is, I think a lot of us of the pre-home video age, as you say, we were kind of limited to what was showing on TV unless we happen to discover the local library having eight millimeter films or finding the Black Hawk catalog where you could acquire films. And that was really the only type of film you could have in your hands to watch a complete movie that wasn't on TV it was the silent stuff acquired that way. So that's how I largely became acquainted, at least in terms of seeing them. I, I ran across some books that reference them. And of course, there's famous monsters of film land. But in terms of actually being able to see them, yeah, it was the eight millimeter stuff. So what about you? Where did you uh, get exposure to those? Well, on those shows I was talking about, I think they probably showed Phantom of the Opera, Hunchback of Notre Dame, and maybe one or two others. But those would be the big ones that pretty much everyone is familiar with. And for many years, that was probably it for me. The vast majority of these, watching them for our show, for horror guys. So most of the ones in the book, those were my first and only viewings for many of them. Hmm. I've seen quite a few of them a lot of times since. But yeah, I don't have any particular background in silent films specifically. Okay. Like you said, they were, they were a little bit difficult to catch in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Now, the films that you have listed in the book, you said there's 34 of them. In looking at them over, they seem to, for me, fall into about four categories. There's ones that I would call foundational, where you're you're getting the the George Melies films, uh, the fantasy, uh, that sometimes involve horror elements, uh, those that he created. And you've got a couple of those in there that you start out with. You've got the Thomas Edison version of Frankenstein, 1910, and uh, they start becoming a little more sophisticated going forward with the first Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, which you list the 1912 and the 
20, 1912 is really the, the one that I include in this foundational category. Uh, there was also a 1913 production starring King Baggett that was longer, but you covered that first one. And then L'Inferno, the uh, Italian adaptation of Dante's Inferno. Those are the four that really stick out to me in that regard. Yeah, well, basically from the late 1890s, the film started being made. George Milius, like you said, st- began all this with several of the early ones. Well, he's best known for A Trip to the Moon from 1902. Everyone has seen clips of a big bullet-looking rocket ship that shoots the moon in the eye. And it's a very cute scene. It's not much longer than that, honestly. But that's what he's best known for. But he also did the first horror movie in 1896, The House of the Devil. And it's two and a half, three minutes long. There's not much to it. A man conjures the devil and scares some people, and it's over. There's not much to it. But it's considered the very first horror film. He also did one called The House of Goats in 1908, which probably isn't the first haunted house film, but it's the only that's the earliest one that is still still available. There are a lot of lost films out there. Right. And it's available on YouTube. These three travelers go into a house. They do some hijinks with the bed. There's a horrible face outside the window that peeps in the door. But the really magical part of it is, is the dinner cooks itself. There's some sausages that chop up. Nobody's holding the knife. How did that happen? Must be the devil. Must be the magic. We don't know. And it, it's almost as much comedy as it is horror. Yeah. But there's ghosts. There's that big scary thing outside. And horror back then is not what it was today. Oh. <laughs> Things have gotten a lot more sophisticated. That's for sure. And what a lot of people don't know is in 1903, he did one called The Infernal Cauldron. Another three minutes short. Not much to the story. This demon throws some people into a boiling pot and they, they come out as ghosts or angels or something. But it's in color. It was one of the very first color films. And he literally hand painted each of the little cells on the film. It's a two, three minute film. How much time would that have taken to have to have painted by hand? That's crazy. But I, I did mention that all of these are available on YouTube. And that is one of the big things about the age of these things. They are all now, almost all of them, except some of the more recent ones are in public domain. You can view almost all of them on YouTube in entirety. And they're just as good now as they were back then. Yeah, I watched a number of these in preparation for this episode on YouTube, although there was one, I'll mention it later, that I was not able to find. Well, okay, it's available on YouTube, but with a subscription, and I want to oh. pay the money for that. I wanted to get myself a hard copy, so I I ordered it. But uh, I'll I'll mention that a little later. Well, then we go into the titles that are getting a little more sophisticated, and there's a group of them that. I think are going to be pretty well known by either people who have a general knowledge of horror movies and some history or people who have a general knowledge of silent films or history of movies in general. We're getting into the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I mentioned before 1920 starring John Barrymore. Of course, I cannot think of that one without remembering. There's one of the transformation scenes. I'm, I'm going to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it. I know here because it just it cracks me up. One of the transformation scenes, I think he's going back to Mr. Hyde from being or, or no, going back to Dr. Jekyll from being Mr. Hyde. And he's thrashing around so much. One of his fake finger extensions goes flying off camera. But then uh, around the same time, we're getting the Golem, uh, some of these German films, uh, the Golem, Nosferatu, which there is a remake uh, about to come out of that. Well, another one. I mean, Werner Herzog did one back in the 70s. Uh, and then, of course, there was the really fun movie with Willem Dafoe, Shadow of the Vampire, kind of a, uh, um, a, a sort of comedy horror behind the scenes of the making of that that was fun. And then also in the 20s, we're getting Hunchback of Notre Dame. You mentioned Phantom of the Opera. Now, Metropolis is in there. And that's one of a number of films that if it were me, I wouldn't really classify them as horror films but over the years over the decades they have gotten lumped in with horror films i mean that one is really more sci-fi but in fact the book where i remember first seeing images from it was one called terrors of the screen frank manchel and you know it had all these other classic horror films and 
there was an image from Metropolis. So he's talking about that. So they do have these elements that, uh, that creeped out audiences in one way or another, even if the overall thrust as in Metropolis was science fiction, that sort of thing. So any of those films strike a particular chord with you? Oh, all of them are great. They're, they're all very influential, very important. Now, we were talking a few minutes ago about, about George Melias and his shorts. Yeah. From 1896 to about 19, 1910 or so, almost everything was a short film. You know, three minutes, four minutes at most. And we did skip over a few of them. Like you, we didn't mention that Thomas Edison's Frankenstein from 1911. Right. That was about 15 minutes, and it was the first depiction of Frankenstein on screen. YouTube it again. It's on there. Have you seen that one? I have. Yeah, I actually had uh, the thing about that one was it was considered lost for a long time. And then they turned out that there was this guy, I think his name was Al Detlaff, had the only known surviving print of it, but he was holding on to it and he wouldn't release it generally. And finally, he cut a deal to release it on DVD. And I have the DVD. It was included, I think, Nosferatu. There was a public domain print included on that same dvd now after that after his death apparently his estate released it more generally there was a restoration done with some tinting and it, it just looks so much better and so yeah that's that's readily available on youtube yeah a lot of the films we're going to talk about were considered lost at some point or were later found somewhere and some of the ones we're going to talk about were lost and they still are we may never see them right yeah um then there's other ones like well, instead of being the short film, they, they started getting longer and longer. The first full-length horror film was L'Inferno, 1911, Dante's Inferno. It was the Italian's first full-length film. Not necessarily horror film. It was the first full-length Italian film. And it was like almost two hours long. Dante took a tour of hell. He went to this section of hell, then this section, then this section. I thought it was pretty boring, honestly. It's just <laughs> a, a long tour of one thing after another. But it had a huge number of extras, giant casts, some pretty decent special effects, but almost no story to it. So they were making them longer, but they weren't necessarily making them any better. You mentioned the 1912 edition of Jekyll and Hyde, and it told the whole story very well, a lot of detail in only 12 minutes. So just because they were short doesn't mean that they had to cut the story to pieces. Right. Frankenstein was pretty short. They didn't tell much. Jekyll and Hyde, you kind of got the whole story right there in that 12 minutes. But then they started making them longer and longer. And like you said, then the major titles started coming out. 1920 was a huge year for these things. Cabinet of Dr. Caligari came out. The other Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde the golem and quite a lot of others but those three right there were pretty major the cabinet of dr caligari was a german film it pretty much introduced the idea of german expressionism if you watch caligari the first thing you notice is the scenery most of it is matte paintings and cheap looking backgrounds but the buildings are all off at an angle the pathways go swirling off into the distance the trees are all gnarly it's got a very distinctive look to it. Yeah. And that, that same idea of expressionism is used in several other films that we're going to get to later on. And it, it was very influential for all these silent films. If you can't talk, you have to look good. Without any real budgets, these kind of matte paintings and off-kilter sets really made that distinctive look of these films. And yeah, and then you talk Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from 1920. And this was one of the first ones that was really paced pretty well. A lot of these old films were slow. I mentioned L'Inferno was kind of boring to me. They linger on things that they think are interesting. Look at this creepy tree for 45 seconds. Here's a doorway that's a little off center for a minute and a half. No, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, they started getting much more modern pacing. Stuff happens, more stuff happens, and then it's over. It never gets boring. It's black and white, it's silent, but it's not boring, which I think is a problem for a lot of these films with much younger viewers today, sitting through them. Right. Yeah, it's very difficult with silent films. You've got no music, or if there is music, it doesn't really match too well. There's obviously no sound effects. There's reading. What is this? It's reading a movie. 
you get these little title cards. Every so often, you see people's mouth moving, and then you read the words. And this is a problem for the filmmakers back then. How much is too much text? At one point, is it better just to read the book? So they had very limited dialogue in a lot of cases. If they didn't have limits on their dialogue, it would be too much work to read these things. So it's always a fine balance when you're making a silent film. How much do you show? How much do you tell? How much can you say in quotes there? It's difficult. It really is. Yeah. And sometimes you have to really watch the actors closely because in lieu of having title cards with a lot of exposition or dialogue, you have to kind of read into the gestures of the characters. I mean, they, they may, one person may run up to another and be trying to tell them something, but instead of putting all of the words on the screen through the gestures, you kind of have to interpret, okay, this is what he's communicating to this other person. And a lot of cases that looks like hamming it up or really overacting, but without the words, the visuals is all there is. You have to make it really obvious. Someone wants to fall in love. You have to get on your knees and look like you're proposing. You're scared. You got to raise your hands and look in fear. It, It would be terribly overacting today, but it was the only way to do it. Going back to those title cards, though, there was a benefit of that. You could make an international film very easily. There are people who are on screen, they're moving their mouths, words come out. All you do is change the text, and suddenly your German film is in English. International releases. Yeah. And without that, it would have been more challenging for us to discover a lot of these films, uh, particularly, you know, from Germany, Caligari, The Golem, Nosferatu, you know, et cetera. A lot of these films are from Europe. Yes. Yeah. But the best ones are actually from Europe in a lot of cases. Right. Yeah. You mentioned mentioned the Golem there. Another one from 1920. Basically, it's a Jewish community and they're being tormented by the king. He's putting all these new rules and restrictions and taxes into place. They all need help. So one of the high priests, one of the rabbis, he's got this spell. They build this man out of clay and they do the spell and he comes to life and he protects the villagers. and He does all these heroic things and he works for the villagers and he does a favor for the king and the king pardons everybody and they're all happy. Except there's a bad guy in the village who takes advantage of the golem and to steal the high priest's daughter to marry him. And things go badly from there. (laughs) Yeah, I remember that had one particularly creepy scene. I thought that's the one where the the rabbi and and this story, incidentally, is it's part of Jewish folklore. So it 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 not only predates Frankenstein, but it's seen as kind of a precursor to Frankenstein, you know, bringing a human creature to life. But there's that scene where he summons some sort of demon, I guess, who gives him this magic word that goes on the scroll that's going to bring the golem to life it's been a long time since i've seen i might be mixing up some element of that but i remember that particular scene where he's he's bringing forth that demon. that was extremely creepy yeah he didn't know how to do it himself he had to find out from the demon yeah that was that was a pretty good scene but yeah that, as you said that was very influential in frankenstein a lot of the kind of zombie movies a lot of the later on robot out of control movies this came first It was actually the third of a series. It was a remake and a prequel of another film that came out several years earlier that's lost now. The original one came out in 1915 and was like a short 15, 20 minute one. Got lost. There was another that had a princess in it and the golem was part two. This was actually the third of the series, but it's the only one that remains today. So it's the only one I've seen. Oh, I didn't realize it was a series. I, I knew that it was a remake. I thought it was, <laughs> I, I thought it just thought, well, okay, let's do it again, only better. <laughs> well, I think the 1915 one was basically this story as a short form. Then there was one in the middle that is just lost. And then this was a remake of the 1915 version. So they're, they're kind of both the same story. But yeah. yeah, this is what we've got. And then we get into a group of films that, I kind of classify as significant, but less well-known. They're not obscure, but they're they're not the ones that the average person with passing familiarity to the genre is going to know. Some of them have, well, actually, I guess the only one I have on here really that has Lon Chaney is one of my favorite Lon Chaney films, The Penalty. 
penalty is actually is one of my favorites. <laughs> it's uh, very comic booky in a lot of ways. It's a gangster film. It's not exactly a monster film, but there's this little boy who goes to the hospital. I think he's got a bump on the head, and the doctor amputates both his legs. Sure, why, why not? <laughs> he's made a mistake. He's got a, he's got his patients confused. I was and looking at the chart he, upside down. What was I thinking? <laughs> yeah. Oops. But anyway, the little boy grows up and he gets in, involved with the gangs and he eventually takes over as the gangs. And one thing leads to another. And before long, he's wanting to take over the city. And once he controls the entire city, he's going to get new leg. And a couple of times he talks to various people in town and says, well, oh, you got nice legs there. And you know he's looking at them because he wants them for himself. And it all goes badly. But just the ridiculous idea that he he's going to once he takes over the city, he can have someone put new legs on him. is just ridiculous. It, it, it's but it's good. Lon Chaney is very sympathetic in this. Well, he's the bad guy. He's the monster. But you kind of feel for him because he didn't ask for the situation he's in. The most amazing thing about the penalty really is what Lon Chaney did in this movie. Uh, I talked about this with Michael Blake a yeah. few episodes back, is that this is not one where he made himself up as he did in Hunchback of Notre Dame or Phantom of the Opera. He didn't use his makeup kit so much. He created this leather harness to strap his legs back so he would look and move around like a double amputee. And it was very physically demanding on him, but it was a, an extraordinary effect. And he was very good at it. Yeah. He, you could see his physicality in a lot of his movies. The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which we haven't talked about yet, he did all his own stunts. In the beginning of that movie, he's like swinging around on the outside of the church. And he was really doing that. Another one that I like a lot that he did was called The Unknown from 1927. In that one, he's a circus man with no arms. He uses his feet to throw daggers at people on the stage. And, and just like in, just like with the harness with his legs, he had his arms tied behind his back in real life. Yeah, and that was really a unique and maybe the only situation where Cheney required the assistance of someone else to pull off some sort of effect with his body. Of course, it was different than applying makeup or strapping on something like the hump for the hunchback, that sort of thing. In this case, they had a guy who I guess himself was actually armless and who had all these abilities to utilize his feet. So they rigged up uh, situations such as chairs, tables, where you would see what looked like Cheney doing things with his feet like drinking tea or throwing, well, throwing the knives as part of the, his character's carnival act. Uh, but you saw his torso, but this guy was situated underneath him. So his legs were coming up from what appeared to be Cheney's body. But as you say, in something like the hunchback where he needs to climb around or the penalty where he needs to climb around without the assistance of his legs. Yeah, he would do that himself. And so he must have really had some very impressive upper body strength. Yeah. In, in the penalty, he was still doing a lot of physical things. At one point, he had pegs in the wall where he had to crawl, crawl through a hole in the wall. It's still a lot of a lot of body strength there. He was. Yeah, uh, he's best known for his makeup, but he did a lot more than that. Right. In uh, The Unknown and in The Monster and in all of them, basically, all the ones where he's not wearing makeup, you can tell he actually does really act quite well. He's very good at this. Oh, yeah. It comes through a lot in The Phantom of the Opera and Hunchback, and of course, but you can't see his face so well in those. But he really did act really well. He was a very good actor at the time. Yeah, his face communicated a, a great deal. There's a scene from... I believe it's he who gets slapped that's in the, the terrific Kevin Brownlow documentary, Lon Chaney, A Thousand Faces, where he has this scene of, of just emotional anguish under the clown makeup. And it's very impressive to see. Yeah. So then in the significant but less well-known category, we've also got, well, here's here's one that I had not seen before. I knew of it. I had not seen it. I watched it this week, and this is one that comes from Sweden, I believe. Uh, the Phantom Carriage by the director, Victor Schostrom. Charlie Chaplin said it was the best film he ever saw. Where, would you go that far? No, <laughs> um, and that's another one where I wouldn't really 
call it a horror film so much. It actually reminds me thematically and story-wise, it actually reminds me a lot of a Christmas Carol. Yeah. Yeah. It's a morality play led by various ghosts. The book was written in 1912. The movie came out in 1921, right at the start of Prohibition. Prohibition started the year before this and went on for about 13 years. And the whole moral of the story is drinking is bad. If you drink, you're going to ruin your life. You're going to die. Your family's going to get sick. And it's just terrible for everyone. Not only that, you could wind up as death itself. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's one of those morality things from the time. But they had some really good special effects with sort of translucent carriages, ghost effects where people appeared and you could see through them. It had ghosts. I yeah. wouldn't call it horror. It, it's much more of a morality play. Yeah. It does have cool visuals that would fall in, in line with a lot of traditional horror stuff. But yeah, story-wise, not so much. Then we've got one. Now, this is one that I had seen years ago. I didn't remember it all that well. I just rewatched it. And that's Waxworks. And the director of that is Paul Lenny. And he's he's represented by several films in your book. And one thing that struck me about that also stars Conrad Veidt in, well, in one of the segments. It's, it's kind of an anthology type story, yeah. but Conrad Veidt stars in one of them. And I notice in actually the first of the three stories, which involves a uh, a caliph, I think it is, uh, in, in Arabia, the sets on that were very reminiscent of some of the earlier expressionist sets. And then you get it a little bit also in the final story, which is very brief, Spring Heel Jack, that has a lot of the look of Caligari. Yeah. The, the, again, these expressionist ideas carried over into a lot of the films of the time. And Paul Lenny was from Germany. So he, he was familiar with all this stuff. Lenny did The Cat and the Canary, one we didn't talk about. Another one we'll probably get to a little later, The Man Who Laughs. Waxworks, this one here, and another one that came much later that didn't do too well called The Last Warning. So he, he's really well represented with these. But yeah, it was one of the very first anthology films, maybe the first horror anthology. I wouldn't swear to that. But yeah, it had three main segments with a wraparound thing. The wraparound segment is this man gets a job in a waxworks and he has to write the stories of the characters that he sees. And at some point he goes to sleep and turns out the rest of us all a dream. But the first one, as you say, is about a caliph. And it's oh, it's like 40 minutes. It's like half the length of the film. And there's some identity stuff going on there where he hides. And it's long, put it that way. Yeah. Ivan the Terrible is the second segment. And it's much better. Obviously, much more horror related. He's a scary guy. The sets are all dungeon and scary stuff. And then the third one. It's debatable whether it was just very, very short. I think it's like nine minutes of screen time of spring Heel Jack or Jack the Ripper. A lot of experts say there's a missing reel. That one was supposed to have been longer as well. At one point, there was also a plan to be a fourth segment. They didn't have time or the budget to do it. But yeah, it seems very lopsided. The first segment is close to an hour. Ivan the Terrible is you know, 10, 15 minutes. And the Jack the Ripper almost nothing to it. So it's a really lopsided anthology, but it was one of the first. And like you said, with the sets and everything, it did look very good. Yeah. And while we're on the topic of Paul Lenny, you mentioned some of his other films and yeah, he's well represented in this because in addition to Waxworks, as you say, we've got the cat and the canary, which is kind of the, the granddaddy or regarded as anyway, kind of the granddaddy of the old dark house type of films and then also the man who laughs which is a terrific movie it's another one that i really wouldn't classify as horror i mean it along with hunchback of notre dame based on works by victor hugo and both of them have the as their central character someone who's sort of tragically disfigured and so there's a certain horror associated with that but in terms of the story it's i thought man who laughs was closer to a swashbuckler movie than than a horror film and you also mentioned the last warning that's the one that i ordered for myself and watched for the first time that's kind of a variation on the the old dark house except in this case it's the old creepy theater yeah well the cat and the canary was in 1927 it was very successful haunted house film 
had, you know, the secret doors, the hand coming out from little panels, dark and stormy night, all the usual haunted house tropes done very well in sort of a not totally serious kind of way. But it did a lot of money. It it was very successful. So they got Paul Lenny to come back and do the last warning, which was kind of the same thing. Like you said, it's a haunted theater. An actor died on stage, literally. And did his ghost come back to haunt the theater? Well, all these scary things happen throughout the film. And everybody's decided, yes, it is. And at the end, maybe not so much. (laughs) Could be they got Scooby-Doo. You know, it's not really what they thought it was going to (laughs) be. If the, not for you pesky morning, actors. Yeah. Pull that mask off. There's an actor underneath. Sure. But it was not all that successful. It, it did not do as well as Cat in the Canary. So that was, I think, Lenny's last big film. So, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, on the subject of Lenny, one of his last films is a missing film. It doesn't fall into this category, but it's one that I sure wish would turn up somewhere. And that's The Chinese Parrot which was an adaptation of the second Charlie Chan novel. And it was the second Charlie Chan film. The first being a path, a serial house without a key adapted the first novel. That's also lost, but it would be interesting because of all the interesting visuals that he did in his various films. It it would be really nice to see what he did in the Chinese parrot to uh, liven up that story. Yeah. The last warning also was kind of unique and as it was done as a silent film and it was also done as a talkie film. They had it done in both setups. From what I've heard of the reviews of the talkie film, all the complaints were about the horrible, terrible dialogue. But maybe it's better that we've only got the silent film. The talkie has gone lost at some point. Yeah, it was right on that cusp. So that that makes sense. Yeah. Another one from this category of the significant but less well-known that I just watched uh, for the first time was The Bat. Now, uh, this is based on a a famous stage play, which I think I saw a production of years ago in community theater uh, in my hometown of Tulsa. I didn't remember it that well, and I'd never seen the film. But this is another one that's really interesting visually. Yes. Actually, the visuals is probably the main thing of this one. The story, it's, it's kind of a haunted house mystery with some missing treasure in the house. They have to search for it. But the interesting part of this one is what it ended up influencing. If you watch just the first 15 minutes of this film, you're going to see Batman. Bob Kane has admitted Batman was almost entirely, well, not entirely, but heavily based on this film. And you can see the guy running across the rooftops and swinging swinging around. It seems very, very much Batman oriented. And it was. Batman was taken from a lot of this. The film itself was remade later on with Vincent Price. I think it was a much better version because this one really didn't do all that much interesting other than the visuals. There's a prototype bat signal in it, even. There is, yes. <laughs> it, it doesn't yeah, serve the point, same purpose, but still the visual, you know, oh, hey. <laughs> bat up in the sky. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's really very interesting if you're a Batman fan to go back and see this. Yeah, the amazing thing, too, I'm looking at the sets on this and going, good grief, how many stories tall is the living room? I mean, there are, it's like, there are no ceilings in sight anywhere and they've got doors that are what, 20, 30 feet high or tall. (laughs) Another Batman connection on the same subject, going back to the man who laughs, the character Gwynplaine played by Conrad Veidt was one of the inspirations for the Joker. And there are memes going around that have been around for ages on Facebook and places where you see that character you know, painted white with a purple suit, colored in like the Joker. You couldn't tell it wasn't the Joker, but of course it was a black and white film. It, none of that was intentional. Uh, Gwyn Plain in that movie was the hero. He was the good guy. As you said, he's a sympathetic hero. He was kidnapped as a child and disfigured and went through all these hardships. And in the end of the movie, he had a happy ending. In Victor Hugo's original story, he killed himself. But that's another story. It was a happy ending in the movie. Oh, well, as long as as long as there's no spoiler alert needed. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's only a hundred year old movie. <laughs> well, and then, yeah, a lot of these things influence things beyond just the films. The bat influenced Batman, the, the Joker influenced there. So many of these things carried over into later films. Well, I'm we, looking at another one. Yeah. The Hands of Orlock, 1924. Another one starring Conrad Veidt. Yeah. And. 
people may be more familiar with Mad Love starring Peter Lorre and, and Colin Clive, but Hands of Orlock is the original of that. Yes. Actually, Orlock was remade another time between the two. I have not seen that one, but it, it's been remade numerous times. But like I said, the Peter Lorre 1935 film is probably probably the best of them to watch today. I mean, he is hilarious in that film. <laughs> yeah. Very creepy with his metal hands. Yeah, the idea of a famous pianist in an accident, he gets both hands amputated. Oh, what's he going to do? His life is over. Ah, but he can have new hands surgically attached. Where did those hands come from? Oh, wait, they're murderers' hands. What could happen? What could go wrong? Sure. Well, a few deaths later, we find out. But is it real? I'm not going to spoil that one. It's only 102 years old. Right. <laughs> All right. And then probably the the one other one I want to mention from that category is 1927, The Lodger. And that's well, from a very famous director. Alfred Hitchcock. Yes. He had done a couple of films before this that are lost. This was his first, first surviving horror film, The Lodger. It's basically, it's about a serial killer. Uh, these people own a boarding house and the strange man comes to, to, to be a lodger to, to rent a room with them. And they're all like, every time he goes out, somebody dies. What do you think his real name is? Could he be the serial killer? So they start following him around and bad things happen. Is he? Isn't he? We don't know until the very end. But yeah, it's Alfred Hitchcock's first major horror film. And he went on to do a few other films you may have heard of. Horror oh, yeah. and otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And ostensibly, that's the one where he first made a cameo i mean it may be a myth but the story is that they were running a little short on extras so he put himself into one of the crowd scenes yeah that, that's the story and i have yet to see him i i cannot spot him in there maybe, maybe he still had hair at the time it's a little hard to tell ah it could be <laughs> well then the fourth category that i carved out here are the, what i would call obscure titles this includes some that are lost the first one earliest one in that group is called the beetle 1919 yeah. Based on an 1897 novel where an Egyptian princess reincarnates to come back, except she's a beetle. She's a bug. What happens? Don't know. It's a lost film. <laughs> That's a problem. There are hundreds and hundreds of these silent films that have just gone missing. The short films, nobody thought they were important enough to save. The long films, they got shuffled off here and there and disappeared eventually. The most famous one, London After Midnight. One of right. Lon Chaney's films. Everyone's seen pictures of that character, the man in the beaver hat. And he's very creepy looking. Most famous lost film ever from 1927. It existed until 1967 when the last print burned up in a warehouse fire. Nobody's seen it since. It was popular enough. They took a, a lot of still images from the film, you know, just regular photo camera stuff. And people have put together a sort of a reconstruction of that one. It's like 45 minutes long. Have you seen that? I have. Yeah, I believe yeah. that's on the, there was a, a TCM DVD set a few years ago that okay. includes the documentary I mentioned earlier, as well as a couple of the feature films. And that restoration, in quotes, uh, is on there. Yeah, it, the restoration it was not all that entertaining, in my opinion. But then again, it's not the real thing. There's no action. It's just like watching a slideshow. It was remade later on in 19... 35, I believe, of Mark of the Vampire with Bella Lugosi. Right. Also, Todd Browning, same director. Yes. Yeah, they just wanted to redo it with sound. And Bella Lugosi is nowhere near as creepy looking as Lon Chaney, that's for sure. That's yeah. one I'd like to head back. But yeah, the Beatle, the Beatle is missing. The book is available. You can read the book if you want to, but the film is gone. But it was very successful at the time, had good reviews. Why did it, nobody keep it? Don't know. Another one, 1921, Dracula's Death. Right. Dracula with a K. Not based on Bram Stoker's Dracula, but based more on the legends of the time. First film appearance of Dracula. Nosferatu came out the following year. Unofficially sort of a Dracula film. But yeah, this, this Dracula's Death was the first one. It's gone. We don't know why. Just disappeared. Yeah, that one was Hungarian. I knew the existence of it, although it was only relatively recently. In fact, it may not have been until I saw your book that I realized that the title was actually Dracula's Death, as opposed to simply Dracula. I, I knew that the connection to the Dracula that we know was 
virtually non-existent, but they obviously were playing off the name. And yeah. uh, that's a, actually another, that brings to mind another one that is lost. That is a shame. It'll be fun to discover. And that's one called Life Without Soul, which was the second Frankenstein film. I'm not remembering whether that was a, a domestic production or whether that may have been foreign, but it, uh, I think, was a bit longer than the Edison Frankenstein, but that's another one that is lost to us. And then you've got one that is not lost, but for my money, it might as well be. <laughs> it's, it's a Japanese film from 1922 called A Page of Madness. Yes, yeah, it sounds like you've seen that one too. Uh, as much as I could get through before <laughs> realizing, you know, this just doesn't seem to be going anywhere, and there's other films I got to be watching. It's, it's about a, a, like I said, it's Japanese. It takes place in Japan. Uh, the man, the man puts his wife into a mental asylum, and stuff happens. You know what happens as well as I do. It's not clear. There are various scenes of things that go on. Um, there's like a prisoner revolt. There's an escape. But a lot of it makes no sense whatsoever. And a lot of that is because there's a missing reel. We don't know what happened. This one also, there is no, there's no dialogue whatsoever. It's just watching the stuff as it goes on the screen. One thing after another. I don't think it being Japanese has anything to do with it. It's not a language issue. It's just very surreal. It's weird. A page of madness it was lost also for many years and they found it in the director's shed one day in the 1960s that why did he have it stored in his shed we don't know but he found it out there except for one of the reels that may actually explain one of the issues with it you say there's no dialogue what i had the impression watching it was that it was simply missing the title cards because you'd have characters talking to each other but then no cut in of a title card. And so if the only version that was found was in the director's shed, he may have just had a copy of it in which titles had not yet been edited. That's possible, but he did release it. The, the, the director, the original director was alive. He was the one who found it. You'd think he'd have put the text in before he released it. Oh, so it was released that way uh, once it was he found? He found it. He released it. Yeah, he, he he put it out there. So, yeah, it's as official as we can get with a lost reel. OK, well, scratch that theory. Maybe he just <laughs> figured, hey, you know, if you're a lip reader, great. The rest of you. Eh. It is what it is. Yeah. Still okay. makes more sense than a lot of David Lynch films. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Eraserhead flashbacks. <laughs> Oh, wow. That should have been a silent film. Well, I sat that I that's another one. I didn't make it all the way through after after, I don't know, 20, maybe even 30 minutes of sitting there going, what am I watching? It but, gets worse and worse <laughs> as it goes along. But there's another one in here that I was not familiar with, and I did not have the time to go ahead and watch it. So maybe you'll talk about it. And then lightness, it's called Midnight Faces from 1926. Yeah, it's another one of the uh, haunted house mystery types. Basically, it, it's mostly important because it has all the all the tropes. It's got secret doors, hands that grab you off screen, shadowy silhouette, convoluted plot, crooked servants, weird wills. We'll come back to the wills. Strange Asian people and comic relief, black people doing nonsensically stupid things. Racism is a topic we probably ought to talk about in some of these old films. <laughs> oh, no, Asian never people happened. were all bad people. Black people were all scaredy cats, afraid of everything. And this was just a very common thing back in the 20s. It just, none of it would stand up today, not even close. But it was a common trope. But yeah, in this film, the old man dies and he has a will. And he's going to leave it to everything but the person who keeps his last name and can stay sane. Well, there's only one person who kept the same last name as him. Her name is Annabelle. And the trick is, can she stay sane through the movie? And you know what the bad people are going to do? They take care of all the haunted house stuff to try to make her insane. It goes badly. That reminds me of a, a film from the 70s that I remember a friend of mine seeing at the time saying it was really scary. A film called Let's Scare Jessica to Death. I finally watched it. And my reaction was, it should have been called Let's Bore the Audience to Death. <laughs> I just, <laughs> it didn't. Get it was there. Yeah. So, yeah, we've covered 
Oh, well, there's one more I want to talk about, too. And again, this is in the obscure. Obscure, not in the sense that the title will be unfamiliar, but the production I was not aware of. And that's the 1928 production of The Fall of the House of Usher, of course, adaptation of the Edgar Allan Poe story years before Roger Corman came onto the scene. And I started to watch it, but I couldn't stay with it for any length of time because the quality of the print, and this is on YouTube, I don't know if there's a better quality print out there, maybe in a physical media of some sort, but it it was as if somebody had smeared Vaseline on the lens. So there's things on the screen that supposedly you're, you're supposed to read and you can't even see any lettering and you just can't make out what's going on very well. So I would have liked to have seen that one, but I just couldn't stay with it. Yeah. Some of them are like that. They have not held up well. They've not been restored. The film is degraded terribly. And sometimes what you just described is the best we're going to get. That one was pretty unique. I thought the the, the basic story from Poe is there. The guy goes to the old castle and meets Roderick Usher and his sister Madeline. And there's some bickering going on between the two. And, she dies, maybe, and they bury her away. And he hears the voices late at night of her yelling, let me out, let me out. But this one is different from the post story because at the end, all three of them get out of the house and they have a happy ending. <laughs> what is that about? That's not the way that story is supposed to go. A yeah. lot of these films had happy endings that really they shouldn't have. <laughs> yeah. You're saying Poe wasn't known for that? And not in that one, at least. <laughs> All right. So, so yeah, then, then, I mean, we've talked about some of the recurring names in some of the films, you know, we mentioned Paul Lenny and several of his films in there, Lon Chaney we mentioned several of his films, Conrad Veidt is well represented in there. So these are some of the figures, well, particularly Lon Chaney, Conrad Veidt. I mean, we think of in the later films, Universal or RKO or whatever, some of the big names in horror, we're thinking Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, but in the silent era, I mean, these guys, Cheney and Vite, they were... Those were the two big ones. Yeah, the biggies. So just in general, wrapping them all into a, a big ball, what are some of your favorites? Yeah, I'm not going to have anything too surprising to say here, but I, I think the best ones, the ones that hold up today the most, Hunchback of Notre Dame, which we didn't really talk about all that much, but I think most people are familiar with the story. The Phantom of the Opera. Very super creepy ending, although I think the first half kind of drags a little bit. Just my thoughts on that one. Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Spoiler, it's got a twist ending. (laughs) One of the first ones to do something like that. And of course, my favorite of all time, one we barely talked about, Nosferatu. If you're going to introduce somebody to a silent film, Nosferatu, or maybe Metropolis, if they're more into sci-fi. They both look great. Metropolis might be a little sketchy on the pacing. It's a little long, but they both really hold up very well. Nosferatu particularly, you don't get much more influential than that. A few months ago, Last Voyage of the Demeter came out. I was just thinking about that one, yeah. The creature in that looks like Nosferatu. There's a segment of the Nosferatu story that, you know, on the ship, it's, it's the same thing, just expanded. Anytime you've seen a vampire that's bald with pointy ears, you know it's coming from this. Salem's Lot. Mm -hmm. Oh, there there are many of them like that, where he looks like that. The idea that vampires die when the sunlight shines on them came from Nosferatu. That's not in Bram Stoker's book. He didn't die from sunlight. That came with this movie. And the whole thing was illegal as anything. They did not have the rights to do a Dracula story. So they say, let's just change the name and change the ending a little bit. We'll steal Bram Stoker's story. And then they got sued by Bram Stoker's estate, had to destroy every single print out there. And again, it was lost for a while until they found a copy in somebody's, I don't know, garage or something. But it's been restored and it looks great now. Best of the bunch, in my opinion. Yeah, I've told the story before. Uh, when I was in high school, I had an eight millimeter print of it. And a friend was having a Halloween party at his house. And we included as part of the party a showing of my eight millimeter print. And we put together a soundtrack utilizing music from the Omen, Psycho and Jaws. It was nicely effective. And in in terms of showing uh, Metropolis to a younger audience, uh, maybe the Giorgio Moroder version would be the, the foot in the door that way. That actually brings me to another question too. And that is, 
younger horror fans for whom Friday the 13th is vintage horror. How do you introduce younger fans of horror to these early films? Very sneakily. (laughs) (laughs) I, I think if somebody's into vampires, you have to show them the first vampire film, Nosferatu. Somebody's into science fiction, you show them this old robot film. You, you, you may not have heard of it. It's called Metropolis. You like sad monsters? Hey, there's this hunchback movie. You have to compare it to something that's out there now that they like. If you just sit somebody down and have them watch The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, probably going to be bored to death. There's no music or the music that is there doesn't really match, which is another problem with these. We don't know what kind of music most of them played. Unless you get there's a really most... good restoration, something put out by Sometimes. Kino or, or somebody yeah. like that. Yeah, a lot of them do not hold up to young viewers. The TikTok generation, five minute time span, and you got an hour and a half of Dante going from tour group to tour group in hell. It's not gonna work. But I think they have to have a pretty good, pretty good interest in these films to begin with before they go into silence. But yeah, I think that the the big ones, Hunchback, Phantom of the Opera, or something like that, Nosferatu, or the, the big ones are good. Okay, well, that I think gives us a good overview of the topic and your book. And as I say, this is the Horror Guy's Guide to Silent Age of Horror Films by Brian Shell, with whom I am speaking. And it, it'll serve as a nice introduction if you know any young horror fans that you'd like to give them something new to explore that might open their eyes to a whole new vista of films. Pick this up. It, it'd make a good, uh, good gift for them. So now we come to the final question, the one I ask all my guests, and that is, what is your most memorable movie-going experience? Well, my family, when I was young, was never a big, were never big theater goers. We were TV people for sure. I think the the first major, well, I mean, there were were little Disney films and things when I was little. The first big one, of course, was Star Wars. The movie had been out for six months before I got to go see it. So I had heard the recorded versions, I'd read the books, I'd read the comic books were out by that point, and by the time we got to the movie, I had already spoiled, I knew everything about it. So it just wasn't, was not maybe as good as it could have been, but it was still the biggest thing ever. Seeing that spaceship fly over was the most memorable thing ever as far as theaters go. But another one that probably may be a little off topic for you was 1985. My first job out of high school, the very first thing I bought was this newfangled thing called a VCR. Opened up thousands of movies that I could not see before. You know, before that, like we were talking earlier, Saturday night movies for the horror films. You took what was on the three networks or maybe a fourth network if you're lucky. VCRs open up a whole nother world of thousands of movies before Blockbuster, but there was always like five or six little independent movie rental places in town. And things like Alien, I never saw that in the theater. I had to wait till I got a VCR for that thing, a videotape. Uh, So many films, like these old silent films, were available on videotape at that point. And that's where things really opened up for me was the VCR. I look, I don't have a VCR anymore. I haven't had a VCR in 20 years. But that's what that's what did it for me right there. All right. Well, very cool. So once again, Brian, tell us where we can access the Horror Guys. At HorrorGuys.com, all one word, or HorrorBulletin.com for our newsletter. Uh, you can find all our books at HorrorGuysShop.com. We've got the silent film book that we've been talking about. But there's also the s- similar books for Hammer Horror, Amicus Horror, Every single horror film that Peter Cushing did, every single horror film that Vincent Price did, every single horror film that Roger Corman did, I'm currently working on Boris Karloff. He'll be out in a month or so. Yeah, he did so many. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, very good. All right. Well, once again, Brian, thank you for joining me on Movie Nights and Matinees. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks again to those of you who've opted to spend some time with us. I hope we piqued your interest in seeing some of these early creep fests. You know, one fun idea for Halloween might be to get one of those little compact video projectors, hang a sheet over a window, and present a show to your trick-or-treaters with a rear screen projection of some of the films we've talked about. Well, the shorter ones, anyhow. If you want to check out the Horror Guys library, 
Pay a visit to the Movie Nights and Matinees website's bookshelf page, where you'll see the book covers and you can order them by clicking on the images, which will take you straight to Amazon. Likewise, many of the movies we talked about can be found on the screening room page and ordered in the same manner. Scroll down to Brian's photo on the Featured Guests page, and if you click on it, it will take you to the Horror Guys website, where you can start an entirely new adventure. You can also offer up some comments or questions via the comments page, or if you want to maybe interact with some fellow listeners, visit the Movie Nights and Matinees Facebook page and share your thoughts there. If you haven't already done so, please click on the follow or subscribe button wherever you listen and submit a rating and review where possible. Be sure to join me for our next episode, which will feature the return of not one, but two prior guests who will tag team with me for another rousing discussion. In the meantime, happy Halloween and, um, boo.